So this morning we've been talking about truth matters. Okay? And uh, we are actually on our last stretch on, on the book of Acts. Uh, if you will note, we started with where the church was born in the day of Pentecost. And then when the church started to, to expand their borders. And we are actually on the third segment. And the main player in this section is actually Paul. If you recall, his name used to be Saul. But after his conversion on the way to Damascus, okay, God started to change his life. And this is where Paul started to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And praise God for Paul, because you and me are here today this morning. Amen? Do you know this guy? Chris Burke. Okay. Uh, Chris Burke is actually an American Down Syndrome advocate. And he was an actor and a folk singer. Okay. Uh, he has become best known for his character Charles in Corky Thatcher on television series Life Goes On. So Edwin is very right. So you know the age of Edwin, okay? He's about, uh, it's about 30. Okay, so, you know, he has a Down syndrome. What is a Down syndrome? It's not up, right? It's down. <laughs> this guy has uh, some, some deformities in his, in his uh, genetics. That's why he's called Down syndrome. But, you know, in one of the interviews that he had, he said that the talents that you have are God's gift to you. But what you do with them is your gift to God. Do you agree with that? And further, he said, obstacles are what you see when you take your eyes off the goal. I never try, I try never to take my eyes off the goal. So just imagine a person what's with some issues or genetics, issues with him, okay, he became very successful. And one of the secret said that I always put my focus on my mission. I always focus on what's given to me. And you know what, many people, the reason why sometimes we are not progressing in our Christian walk, we are not progressing in our uh, achieving our goals in life, it's because we take so much emphasis on our obstacles rather than looking at our mission in life. We have a purpose why God created us. We have a purpose why God saved us from sin. And comes that purpose is a mission that God has given you and me. Some of us, our mission is to become a doctor. Some of us, our mission is to become a good student. Probably a good business person. Probably a good singer. A good musician. A good evangelist. A good leader in church. But you know what? Sometimes people go out of track because they forget their mission. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm sorry, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 6, it reads, Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, who is the source of all things. And we exist for who? For God. Look at the person next to you and say, you exist because of God. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things that have been created, and we believers, okay, exist and have life and have been redeemed through Jesus Christ. This morning, 
Our topic is about perseverance. Persevere because truth matters. Now, missing your mission is like living with no reason. So don't miss your mission. The challenge is persevere. What is perseverance or how do we persevere? Perseverance is, or persevere is continue a course of action even in the face of difficulty or with little or no indication of success. I'm sure some of you have experienced doing something and you know that even how much you try, you already think that this is going to be a failure, right? And what do we normally do when that happens? Some people stop, some people move on, some people take a different course of action. I do not know where you are right now in your life. Probably you're pursuing something and you encounter difficulties in life. Probably you're trying to pursue your career and as you pursue your career, you experience a lot of hiccups. Or it's just me. It's just me. Oh, so sad. But you know, that's true. At one point in my life, I'm trying to pursue something, and they all failed. Because apart from the mission that God is giving us, okay, we would normally fail. The first item I'd like to discuss this morning is about persevere even if we are mistreated. How many of you here have experienced being mistreated? In Greek, they call it maltrato. Who among you here have experienced to be maltreated? Right? Sometimes you're trying to do things right, and because of some people who don't like you, what do they do? They mistreat us. You know, in Acts chapter 14, as we continue our series on the book of Acts, we can see that Apostle Paul experienced mistreatment. If you recall from the previous lessons that we have, Paul and Barnabas, they were sent out from Antioch and they were sent out to the different provinces in Asia Minor. And because of that, they were mistreated. What happened last week in our lesson? While the Gentiles readily accept the gospel, and in fact, they wanted more to hear from the gospel, what happened? The Jewish people, they mistreated Paul and Barnabas. What did they do? They tried to incite people to go against Paul and Barnabas. And as we continue in Acts chapter 14, everybody read with me. In Iconium, Now, if you will see that when they moved on into their missionary journey, they came to a place called Iconium. Okay? And when they entered the synagogue, they started to preach the gospel. When they go to the different places, they don't just go there just to visit. They go there for one single mission, and that is to spread the gospel. So when they went there, people accepted them. But let's look at first the journey of Apostle Paul. We can see here, this is the, the map of Turkey. Actually, I, Asia Minor is the modern-day Turkey. We can see that the gospel started in Jerusalem, and then it moved to Antioch. And from Antioch, Barnabas and Saul were dispatched or they were commissioned by the church in Antioch to spread the gospel to other areas of, of the region. 
from Antioch, they went to a place called uh, Cyprus. Okay, and then from Cyprus, they take the vessel or ship and they went to other areas in, in, in the region of Turkey. So we can see that both Paul and Barnabas, they were really eager to accomplish the, the mission that was given to them. And if we continue in verse 2, it says, But the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. What is it saying here? That when they started to preach the gospel, the Jews, the very people that Paul belongs to, they were actually inciting people not to listen to him. You know what? Every time we do God's mission, or even our missions in life, there will always be opposition. There will always be opposition. People will always oppose us. Right? For the students, sometimes our mission is to finish our, our, our degree. And as we study hard, as we try to do our mission, there will be opposition. What are some of these opposition? Probably opposition in such a way that some of us may probably run out of funds. For those who have cars, our cars will, will break down. Okay, there will always be opposition. And you know what? If we can see here, that the Jews stirred up the Gentiles and embittered the brethren. That was very difficult for Saul and for Barnabas. And if we continue in verse 3, it says, Therefore, everybody... Oh, I remember in Mark chapter 16, verse 17, it says, These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Every time God gives us a mission, God enables us. So for Paul and Barnabas, the mission was for them to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And because of that, God enabled them, has given them the power, not only to speak boldly of God's word, but also to lay hands on the sick. And the sick recovers. That means there were signs and wonders. As Christians, our mission is to spread the gospel. And signs and wonders will follow. Some of us think that, oh, it's not happening because we haven't tried it. And you know what? Every time you pray for your friends, every time you pray for your relatives if they are sick, as you share the gospel, the Bible promises us that signs and wonders will follow. Hey, Brother Rich, if I pray for them and they die, what will happen? Actually, that was my fear before. When I was a youth pastor then of a different church, I was asked to pray for the sick. I was very hesitant. Why? Because I said, if I pray for the sick and the sick dies, what happens? You know what? Healing from our sickness is important. But what is more important is the healing of our spirit. And many people are sick in their spirits. People are dying without the Lord. They are sick and they need the Lord. Salvation in itself is a miracle. And as the person receives Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, that in itself is a miracle. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Convincing. Yes. Are you guys convinced? Yes. Why? Because we need to prepare our lives for eternity. 
So let's move on. In verse 4, it says, But the people of the city were divided, and some sided with the Jews, and some with the apostles. It's just like what's happening in politics, right? I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat. Okay? I'm glad that there is no Republican, no, Demo no Democrat in church. We are all children of God. Right? We're all Christians. That's what's important. Verse 5. And when an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers, to what? And to? Wow. So people were already talking about stoning these two apostles. If you were in the shoes of Barnabas and Saul, what will you do? Some people might say, no more, no more. I won't do it anymore. But not with Paul and Barnabas. And on verse 6, it says, And they became aware of it and fled to the cities of Okay, and Lystra and Derby. This is not the Derby, the Sabong, huh? And the surrounding regions. Of course, they know that people will stone them. If you were on their shoes, what are you going to do? Some people will say, well, God sent me. I remember there was a, a tele-evangelist in the Philippines before when the Abu Sayyaf... Uh, took hostage some people he said I'm going to Marawi or in, in that region and then I will face them and I will say to the scud missile stop and it will stop so now his life has stopped <laughs> okay because in Proverbs it says a prudent man sees evil and hides himself the naive proceed and pay the penalty. So when there is an earthquake, what will you do? You will hide under the, the table. Not that you will say, I am a Christian, I will not die. Right? In Proverbs it says, the prudent man, when he sees evil, you know what? God gives us the wisdom. When things happen, we should not be, you know, go out there, Oh, there's coronavirus. I will not get sick because God is with me. Right? You know, some people, I cannot understand. They have that, how I wish I have that faith too. But their faith is fake sometimes because they are trying to test God. Right? We are not here to test God. Let's continue in verse 7. They were already persecuted, and what were they doing? And they continued to preach the gospel. They were unstoppable. Are we being mistreated? Are we being persecuted? If our mission is very clear, we should not be stopped. We should be unstoppable. The second point, persevere even when misunderstood. Have you been misunderstood? Many times, right? Sometimes we wanted to pray for the person. Oh, I'm praying for you. No, you're praying for me to die. <laughs> so we need to persevere even if we are misunderstood. In verse 8, let's continue. At Lystra, so while Paul was preaching, was sharing the gospel, there was this man from Lystra. And when he looked at him, he got an urging from the Spirit of God that this person will be healed. 
Sometimes, you know, when we pray for a person, we know and we know deep inside that this person is ready for salvation. And what did Paul do when he had that urging? In verse 10, he said in a loud voice, Okay? You know what? God prepares. You know what? Sometimes when we pray for people, and God gives us the urging that this person is ready for the gospel, our role is to be obedient and do what God is asking us to do. Just like this person. God has already started to work in his life. That's why when Apostle Paul was preaching the gospel, he already know in his heart that God is going to save this person or God is going to heal this person. And with a loud voice, he shouted, what? Stand upright on your feet. And immediately, the person started to leap and began to walk without laying of hands, because God is not limited with the laying of hands. And in fact, you can also pray for people even on the phone. You can pray for people even in the internet, even in FaceTime. Last week, I just prayed for one of my coworkers because his brother was in life, life support for drug overdose. And while I was praying for him, you know what? I started to cry because I had the joy of praying for a person who has not known Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. And the dude started to cry also. You know what? With God, nothing is impossible. Do you believe that? Looks like you're not convinced. Okay. Verse 11. When the crowds... So, okay, I think 99% of us here are Filipinos, right? We speak Tagalog, majority of us. It's just like here. Probably Paul was preaching in English. I was preaching in English. And all of a sudden, when the layman started to walk, the people started to talk in Tagalog. See? When the crowd saw what Paul did, they raised their voice, saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they began to call Barnabas, Asus, and Paul, Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. So you see, those of you who have Hermes bugs, that's biblical, huh? Okay, so they called Barnabas Asus and then Paul as Hermes. Why? Because Paul and Barnabas were actually preaching to the Gentiles, to the Greeks. And you know, from school, we learned about Greek gods. Correct? Okay, and they were talking about Zeus and, and Hermes. So this is Zeus on the left side and Hermes on the right side. Okay. Zeus is actually the god of the thunder in ancient Greek religion. And Hermes is a deity in ancient Greek religion. And he is considered to be the herald of the gods. So he's the spokesperson. Since Paul was the one preaching, they called him Hermes because he was the one imparting the word of God. Let's continue in verse 13. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, what happened? Okay. 
So when we heard, when they heard about the miracle that has happened, the news spread. You know, in the olden days, they don't have Facebook. In our days, when something happens, what do we do? Right? We just go to the restaurant before we eat. Instead of praying, we take the picture of the food and post it on Instagram. During those days, they don't have that. But because of the miracle that has happened, the news rapidly spread. And when the priest of Zeus heard about it, what did he do? He brought oxen, garlands, not to give to Paul and to Barnabas, but that is in preparation for them to make sacrifices. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to who? To a living God. Who is that living God? He is the one who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Ladies and gentlemen, apart from God, anything that we're thinking is actually vain. Apart from the truth, those are vain things. In modern lingo, they call it fake news. Because Paul and Barnabas, they were preaching what? The truth to the people. Let's continue in verse 16. They said, in the generations gone, by he permitted all the nations to go their own ways. 17, everybody? So do you imagine what's going on? They were probably outside the city and there were a lot of people. They were ready to offer their sacrifices. And then Paul and Barnabas were trying to restrain them, saying, hey, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Because we are men just like you and me. And he was encouraging them. Instead of doing this, we need to turn from the vain things that we have and turn to God. Who is what? The author of everything. So that's what, that was the scenario. And in verse 19, But the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the crowds, what did they do? Can you afford to do that? You have good motives and you're being misunderstood. And because of that, your friend will, is even, you know, even thinking of suing you. What, you know, you know, what an experience, right? I remember when I was kind of new here in the U.S. I was working, I was a supervisor then, and we have, I have drivers under me. But you know what? When I started to talk to my drivers, started to share with them about Jesus, what did they do? They reported me to the HR. The, the union filed a complaint because I, they said I was coercing them. If that happens to you, what will you feel? feel bad. But look at Paul and Barnabas. They went to the extent of what? Stoning him. Who was the first person who was stoned to death? Are you sure it's Stephen? Oh, it's James. Oh, it's Stephen. I'm just trying to test if you guys are listening to our previous lessons. 
Stephen died because, of sto because he was stoned to death. But for Paul, what happened to him? Probably nagpatay-patayan siya or probably he felt unconscious. But let's move on. But when the disciples stood around him, what did he do? He got up and entered the city the next day. He went away with... Okay, what did they do? They hid, but they continued to preach the word of God. We need to persevere even when mission is impossible. Do you have an impossible mission? The mission to reach out to your friend, dos barados, sarado, candado? Do you have a mission to reach out to your friend who is dying of cancer? Do you have a mission to reach out to your, to your neighbor who doesn't like you? Sometimes it's impossible. But we are being admonished this morning. We need to persevere. Let's continue in verse 21. After they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many, wow, my goodness, after preaching the gospel, they made many disciples. They what? They returned to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch. They went back to the place where people dragged them out of the city. You know, Paul and Barnabas, they wouldn't have that courage, determination without the Holy Spirit. Remember in Acts 1.8, it says, But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, in Samaria, in Judea, and the most part of the earth. So they got that courage, that boldness, after they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So they moved on. They went back to their original place. And what were they doing? They were strengthening the souls of the disciples. You see, the incident, or when they started to preach the gospel, many people accepted Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And because of that, these people became disciples. As you see in verse 22, we can see here that they went back to strengthen the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. You know, some people are saying that for you to enjoy life, you need to be a Christian. You know what? Christianity is not a bed of roses. Yes, probably it's a bed of roses, but remember, roses have thorns. Because the moment you have Christ in your life, you become a target of the devil. The devil will do all his best to destroy you. Because in John 10, it says, the devil has come to kill and to destroy. But Jesus said, I have come so that you and me might have life and have it more abundantly. So they have a mission. And despite the fact that they are do doing God's will, what happened to them? They were experiencing tribulation. They were experiencing persecution. Now let's continue on verse 23. And when they had appointed leaders, elders for them in every church, Having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. You know, to be a leader, to be an elder, it is God who appoints us. That's why in CCF, we don't have uh, election for leaders. We don't have, you know, in, in other churches, they elect their elders, they elect their deacons and so forth. Why? Because it is God who appoints us. God appoints us through authorities. Just like Paul and Barnabas were doing, 
They appointed elders and leaders in each and every churches that they visited so that there will be people who will continue to disciple the believers in, during those days. Verse 24, they passed through Pisilja and came into Pamphylia. And they had spoken the word in Perga. They went down to Athelia. From there, they sailed to Antioch, from which they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had accomplished. It's a work well done. At the end of our lives, when we face God, will God say, welcome, good and faithful servant to us? Everything we do is like doing it unto the Lord. God has given us a mission. And I am encouraging all of us this morning. Let's strive. Let's persevere. Despite opposition. Because at the end of the day, it is God who will say, well done, good and faithful servant. In verse 27, and they had arrived and gathered the church together. They began to report all things that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Verse 28, and they spent a long time with the disciples. We can see in the life of Paul and Barnabas that they have been faithful in the things that God has entrusted to them. And the church at that time, they were very happy and they were very eager to get the report from them. The report that God is saving people through the apostles. We can see that the gospel spread not only to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. That's why we are all here this morning. Just like here this morning, you know what? We have people who have decided to follow Christ. You know, I last Friday I was I attended the D group celebration of of Fullerton. I was really blessed with that group. They were telling me that they started their their work in San Dimas, am I right? Diamond Bar, okay. And from Diamond Bar they started to moved to Fullerton, okay? And along the way, there were, they experienced hiccups. But thank God for the leadership. Thank God for the people who persevered amidst the difficulty. Despite the fact that the leaders, our D-group leaders, they were not perfect. Anybody here perfect? Even if your name, I'm not saying your name is perfect, though you will be perfect. But nobody here is perfect. But because of God's grace, but because of the power of the Holy Spirit, God has enabled the people in our group in Fullerton to continue on the work. And you know what? As a result, they started to see the harvest. And I will be calling Ike in a little while to share with us how God has used very imperfect people to share the gospel. And as a result, three of them will be baptized this morning. Now come on, let's give the Lord a hand. But before I call Ike, let me close with this story. This story is about John Stephen Aquari. In 1968, there was an Olympic in Mexico. They pronounce it Mexico. Okay. And 
He is the representative of Tarzana in Africa in that Olympics. They had a marathon. On the way, he experienced setback. He got injured. He even hurt his shoulders. And you know what? While they were starting to award the medal to the winners, this guy was still running. It was already late at night when he entered the stadium, limping. I watched the YouTube of what happened there. He was already limping. He couldn't run anymore, but he continued on to finish the race. And the reporters asked him, what are you doing? There were about 18 runners who already backed out because they got injured and they said, well, this, this, I won't make it. And you know what, what he said? My country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. My country sent me 5,000 miles away for me to finish the race. What race are you running this morning? May I encourage you? Finish it. Because in J James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, it says, Everybody, okay, okay, everybody, please, with feeling, this is the last verse. Go. Consider it all joy. Why do we have to consider it all joy? Are we going to consider it all joy when we encounter various trials? No. We consider it all joy because what? God is going to help us. Consider it all joy because the things that go, that's going on around us, uh, around us is something to what? To give us strength. Who among you here have started grade one and then moved to grade two? Isn't it that before you move from grade one to grade two, you have to at least know how to write your name? And while starting to write your name, isn't it, it too difficult? Too difficult? Especially if your name is too long. I, I used to have a classmate when I was in elementary. Okay, he's got three names. Okay, and uh, the last name is also very, very long. So all of us are done writing our names and he's still at the middle. Very difficult for him. But he moved on. He continued doing it. That's why he, he went to grade two. <laughs> what difficulties are you going through right now? Consider it all joy. Because these trials, as we go through testing in life, it will produce endurance. It will produce endurance. Probably this morning, some of us may have not experienced the mission or have not received the mission that God has given us. Probably because we need to have that relationship with God. I am encouraging you this morning. You know, at the end of our life, what we wanted to hear is a welcome from God. Some time ago, I prayed a simple prayer asking Jesus to come into my life. And when I prayed that prayer, 
that was actually my response to the love of God. My response to the gift that he has offered to me. And that was the gift of salvation. And that prayer goes something like this. Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I acknowledge that I cannot save myself. This morning, I accept you as my personal Lord and Savior. Please come into my life and be the Lord of my life. That was the simple prayer that I prayed at the time. And since then, God started to impart his mission in my life. I would like to call Ike this morning to share with us very briefly how God has shared the mission to his group and how they persevered. And as a result this morning, we will be baptizing three of their disciples. And before we go to that, I just wanted to share with you some four points what baptism is all about. Baptism cannot save us. But baptism actually signifies that we are a follower of Jesus Christ. It is an act of obedience. It is our public declaration of our inward faith that we are a follower of Jesus Christ. And we are identifying with Christ. So let's welcome Ike. Uh, good morning, brothers and sisters. Um, for the past uh, 14 months in our discipleship group in Fullerton, uh, we have been blessed because of the arrival of uh, our five new members in our group. These are the younger ones. <laughs> they really don't belong to our demographic, but uh, they showed up. There's an inside joke. They just showed up. We didn't call on them. We didn't uh, reach out to them. They just showed up. Brian called me. Uh, Christian called me from out of the blue. We didn't know them, but they just showed up. And uh, it's been a very humbling experience for the original members of our group because of so many things. Number one, uh, we have become a witness to how God is orchestrating things to bring souls to redemption. And it's also humbling because we realize it's not our work. It's God's work. Uh, it's not because of us that souls came to God, that they became Christians. In fact, even before they came to our group, God's work was already at play. And uh, I had a comment from a brother yesterday as we were texting. Oh, Kuya Ike, now it makes sense. Now I see that God has been art at work in my life way back. So we have been humbled because we have been witness to how God is working through people's lives. And we are also humbled because we realize our original group, we're very imperfect people. We're loud, we're very passionate the way we talk about things. And sometimes we may not be coming across as God's humble servants, but God entrusted these people to come to our group, and we are blessed. And we are also blessed because in their engagement brought some fire in our group. These young people going through their journeys in life already having God in their lives, not like me, <laughs> not like some of our members who only discovered Christ er later on in our lives. So they're in a very good position. And um, there's five of them. Three of them are here to get baptized. And I may call on Christian, Brother Christian, Brother Brian, and Sister Maisie to, to the stage. So, having accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, uh, today they're going to make a public declaration uh, of their uh, faith that they are followers of Christ. And I'm, I'm going to pass on the mic to uh, Brother Brian because I think he wants to say something. 
Hi, um, yeah, I'm just going to speak a little bit um, about why I chose to um, get baptized today. Um, I'm not going to share my full testimony, but this is kind of part of it, and I think Christian's going to share his testimony after me. So, um, yeah, uh, my name is Brian. I, I'm, I was actually a Christian my whole life. I was brought up um, in a Christian family, Christian home. Um, I went to the Calvary Chapel um, churches um, around SoCal, and I always thank my parents for that. I had a good foundation, but it's not always that, yeah, I, I've been brought up as a Christian that um, life was easy, uh, being uh, walking in with Christ was easy for me. But, um, it, you know, it's sometimes I feel like I didn't really, I went to church every Sunday, but then after that, the rest of the week, um, I would taper off and then go back to church every Sunday. But I didn't really have that desire, that fire to strengthen strengthen my relationship with Christ um, so you know after all these years there's a lot of temptations and um, I moved to up north and I was by myself um, there's a lot of vices uh, that um, tried to take me but um, I, I, I actually went uh, sought after churches up north too um, I tried to uh, reclaim that fire for Christ but um, throughout the years it's just just wavering so um, in the last few months, and actually when I first met my fiance, Maisie here, um, she's a Catholic, and um, we both sharing our, um, our, our faith to each other, and we would go to um, Christian churches and Catholic churches as well. And um, we are trying to find that fire and trying to share it with each other, and Maisie is the one that actually really tugged me to this church, um, we watched Pastor Bong in the Philippines, his um, his messages online on YouTube. And then we also went to this church a couple times sporadically while going to other Christian churches. And, um, yeah, she she's the one that texted Kuya Ike. Uh, we went to the D group, and we were just so blessed. And uh, we saw the Holy Spirit um, in our lives. And now, like, after all these years, I just have this desire and fire to um, be a part of this church. Um, I, I talked to Kuya Francis and about joining the music ministry um, in the future after a wedding, and um, hopefully that I have that fire to do that and persevere. And it's just like every Friday we, we go to the Bible studies, and it's just a hard thing to commit my whole life to um, like a church and just being um, – uh, being one with the Christ and just being Christ-like. So today I just wanted to just um, just profess my faith and just go through this bath baptism because I know um, this is the start of my real um, journey to Christ. And um, I didn't ask for permission, but um, the elders in our group, we feel like, or at least I feel like, I've gained a, a family. I have two sons and another daughter. And it's very special for me because especially um, that Maisie and Brian are actually going to be married in March. And uh, we just completed uh, premarital counseling yesterday. And Maisie already accepted Christ as her Lord and Savior months ago. And so looking back, all the journey that they went through for the past 12 months leading to that marriage is just a beautiful thing. And... Uh, I'm emotional sometimes. <laughs> and Marina and I, we said driving here, we're not going to cry. But it's, it's such a blessing. It's overwhelming that our family is growing. You know, uh, I mean, I really look at Brian. It's like, he's my son. I feel I'm, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> Marina said, no, no, no. I, I, I see Maisie as like my sister. Or <laughs> Okay, then, but uh, they're, my, they're my kids. I feel like that. And that is another blessing from God. So we acknowledge our kinship in Christ, and we are a family, all of us. So we have to, we have to focus on that relationship. There are distractions. We may have different political opinions, differences in the way the colors are favorite things, right? Those are not important things. The important thing is that we are all related in Christ. And now, uh, Christian, I, I need to cut this short. I'm getting overwhelmed again, but... Christian, again, like, like Brian and Maisie, Christian 
I just got a call from Christian sometime around December of 2018. At the moment, uh, I was in the car with my family in the middle of a conflict. Someone called me asking to join our group. And I was so ashamed with myself, you know, that God said someone to me right in the middle of the conflict. I was not a good Christian at that moment. But I thank God. When they joined us, we persevered. So they gave us the, the, the focus to the goal, which is Christ. And so Christian has a story to tell. I'm going to give the mic and I'll stop talking. <laughs> hello, hello. Yeah, um, I thought I was a good man. Um, I was going to the church mostly every week and um, reading some devotional booklets. Um, as I have been providing for and taking care of my family since my father died in 2004, I thought I had my ticket to go to heaven. I thought all the good things would um, offset all the bad things that I did. I was in an immoral relationship. I indulged myself in pornography, and I was also a drunkard and gambler. I would drink as much as I could handle without throwing up. I once gambled away all my college tuition fees in one night and lied about paying for the whole semester when I act actually pay only paid the entrance fee. I live life with a weighing scale. As long as my bad things are not greater than my good works, I considered myself still okay. Um, I would still go to heaven, thinking my bad things did not even come close to crimes I had seen on TV. I read a lot of self-help books and some materials about God and would say a little prayer every time I needed something, but I was caught in a loop of praying then sinning. I would always go back to my old vices. I was just going with the flow day by day. Life felt empty. In the year 2013, I became friends with, with a Christian in a basketball gym. We started talking about God, and I asked questions about suffering, salvation, and many more. And he would answer all my questions according to the scriptures. We had Bible study once a week after playing basketball. He planted the seed of faith in my heart, and I thought I was doing the right thing. Time went by. I got busy at work and had many distractions that took me away from Bible study. But my Christian friend kept on praying for me to have a genuine relationship with the Lord. In December of 2018, I finally realized that I needed real change. I made a lot of bad decisions that led to some more frustrations in my life. I literally cried out to the Lord and poured out everything to him. <clears throat> I asked God for miraculous signs to happen that night, but nothing happened. However, um, I felt a peace in my heart. The following morning, I found myself watching a YouTube video service from CCF Manila, which then convicted me to Google CCF Los Angeles. I called the number of one of the, um, their dis discipleship groups, got connected, and started attending their Bible study and D group meetings every Friday. On January 23, 2019, after a long conversation with my discipler, I finally accepted Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. He told me that there is no magic word that I need to pray in order to be saved, but all I needed to do is repent, put all my trust in Jesus, and accept him as my Lord and Savior. Since that night, I began reading my Bible more often and attending more Bible studies and D-group meetings. God changed the desires of my heart. I suddenly lost my appetite for my old bad habits and would feel convicted even for small lies. Now, <clears throat> now I am not expecting my life to be storm-free, but I have the confidence that my life will be storm-free storm because I have Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. My life in, in Christ is still a work in progress, but by the grace of God, he sustains me.
As it's written in Psalms 55, 22, cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. My name is Christian Javier, once a sinner and now saved by Jesus Christ, my personal Lord and Savior. To God be all glory and praise.